The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. We are here to study in the Word of God. We're studying in major Bible themes, having completed our little side study that we did on spiritual gifts. And I do pray that you're thinking about what your spiritual gift or gifts might be and that you've prayed about it. Ask God for wisdom with regard to that. But we have now returned back to the book, the study that we have through the book of major Bible themes. And we are currently studying on sin. It's not a topic that we like to think about that much, but we need to consider it and understand what it means, what the biblical doctrine of sin is, and what it means in terms of not only our salvation, but also in terms of sanctification, and that we're going to talk about in the upcoming chapters as well. The opening call to worship, the idea of Observing God's Word, blessed are those who hear the Word of God and observe it, fits right in with our Scripture of the Week this week, which we will talk about later on in the class. Before we begin our study of the Word of God, it's important for us to make sure that we're prepared. Our heart is prepared for such a study. This is not like any other kind of a study that we would do. We're studying God's Word. It's eternal. It's powerful. It makes a difference in people's lives. I pray that it's making a difference in your life. This is an opportunity for us to learn spiritual matters. And in order to do that, we must be spiritual. Lewis Perry Chafer, who wrote this book, also wrote a book called He That Is Spiritual. And it's the idea of what it means to either be spiritual or to be carnal. And if we happen to be carnal, we need to confess our sins and make sure we're filled with the Spirit. Because it is the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, that leads us into the truth. And so let's take a moment for silent prayer. Confess if necessary, but even if you don't need to confess, this is an opportunity to shift gears, get your thoughts focused and ready to receive the word implanted. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are amazed at who you are and the fact that we can know you as we learn your word. I thank you for the blessing it is to have your word, to be able to look upon it and understand truth in a world where things are so muddied and so confused, and yet we can know you through your word, and I thank you that We've come to know your son, Jesus Christ, as our personal Savior. And that because of him and because of the salvation we have in him, we now have a relationship with you. And I pray for all of us, and I include myself in this prayer, that all of us would draw closer to you. That all of us would recognize how short our time is here on this earth. And that we would redeem the time. And use it in a way that pleases you and glorifies you. And Father, I ask that this hour as we study your word, that you would help us to set aside whatever distractions there may be in our lives. Help us to focus. And whether it's a distraction that would be from physical discomfort or whether it's a distraction that comes from our busy lives that we have, just help us to set all that aside and focus on the truth of your word. And Father, I ask that each and every one of us would would learn a little something today, just a little something that helps us to know you a little bit better and draw even closer to you. Father, we ask that you would allow these things to dwell richly in our hearts so that we can live according to them and that we can glorify you with our day-to-day lives. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. We started a study last time looking at sin And this is a little bit of a review, but what we're currently doing is going through and looking at a fourfold presentation of sin as it is in the Bible. We already looked at, if you have the notes, you can go back and look at this if you weren't here for the 
the classes, but we already looked at there's a human, a human approach to sin, which is the worldly approach to sin, which is not at all in accordance with the Bible. Uh, and the idea that some would say that sin's not real because it's, a, it's, it's based on a false uh, presupposition that there's right and wrong. Well, you, we know that's a lie. There is right and wrong. There's truth and there's lie. And there's uh, things that are righteous and things that are unrighteous. And that's what the Word of God helps us to understand. It's what the whole purpose of the law was, by the way, was to show us that there's, a, there's God's standard and then there's where we are. And we don't measure up to that standard. And um, the human, pr- human approach to sin is flawed. And, and there's even been some, we saw the idea of some would take the approach that uh, well, let me, let me back up to that stuff real quick. We'll look at that real briefly. Sorry, I went too far back. The idea that uh, there were some who said that sin was only part of the physical world and that there's no sin in, in the uh, spiritual world. We know that it's in our souls, which is the invisible part of... We have the soul and the spirit, but it's in our souls that we have the volitional capacity to either choose to obey the lusts of the flesh or to obey the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's in our souls, which is an invisible part of us, that we make the decision to give in to sin. James speaks to that. And so we recognize that sin is not limited simply to the physical world, that it's actually uh, involved in the invisible parts as well. But there's this, this approach where they said that sin was part of just the physical world. And so uh, they would say two, they would they would go two completely different directions. One direction was, uh, since the physical world is inherently evil, then any desire my body has is evil, and so I'm not going to give in to any of those desires, including hunger, including um, the normal uh, desire between a husband and wife, and all those sorts of things. And you end up with asceticism, where people start to try to deny anything, any kind of pleasure uh, of the of the. The, the body, and, th- and that's not biblical. The body says there are, I mean, excuse me, the Bible says that there are some things that God uh, created in our human bodies that are not, that are desires that are not sinful. We know that a lot of that's been corrupted, a lot of that's been twisted and distorted, and now has become uh, things that are of, of the devil. But the fact of the matter is, there are desires. The, the desire to eat, for example, is a desire that's given from God. And uh, Adam and Eve were hungry in the garden before the fall. And so there's, a, there's no aspect of that that's evil. And so you get, end up with some who try to deny any of the desires of the body, and that becomes asceticism. And then there's the other ones who fall into antinomianism or epicureanism, whatever you want to call it, uh, the idea that you just don't even worry about the body when it commits sins because that's just the body, and so you ignore that. Both of those are false. And then there's another common approach that says that sin is merely selfishness. We know that sin is a lot more than that. There's certainly selfishness involved in that. But all of those human ideas, the human approach to, uh, to, the, to sin is, is false in terms of the biblical doctrine of sin. We, we saw, and we looked at this before, the teaching of Scripture is that sin is any lack of conformity with the holy character of God, just period. Whether it's an act, an overt act, a disposition, or a state. If we don't conform to the holy character of God, we are in sin. Various sins are defined. We see, we know, everybody knows about the Ten Commandments. I mean, even unbelievers know about the Ten Commandments. And and they rally and protest and ask that they be taken down off of buildings. But uh, they know about the Ten Commandments. These are commandments given from God that that help us to understand sin. And that's the whole law really did that. Sin is always against God, even though sometimes it's directed at human beings. Right? We understand that the ultimate infraction is against God. We have violated His holy character. Unfortunately, sometimes when we sin, in particular overtly, uh, human being, other human beings are impacted, and then that's when it's necessary for us to go and apologize for what we've done. Once we've, con- when, once we've confessed that to God, we need to then make it right with the person or persons. Accordingly... A person who sins is unlike God. In other words, we violated his holy character. We're unlike God, and therefore we are subject to God's judgment. That's the thing. Um, I thought it was interesting. I was talking to I was talking to uh, a pastor up in Duluth at Duluth Bible Church up there, and he was saying that they've kind of changed their approach to giving the gospel. If one of the things I want to do this year is I want to get somebody, probably Doug Clark from Austin Bible Church, to come here and teach a class in ev- of Evantel. It's great because it's, it's, their whole thing is you can tell it, and it's a class that 
helps people to give the gospel. It encourages them and, and, uh, and makes it a lot easier to give the gospel. But their approach is what's called a bad news, good news approach. First thing you do is you give somebody the bad news, right? That we all fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. The idea of the condemnation that we are in uh, under sin, which we're, we're talking about in this study. And then the good news, you talk about what we're going to talk about in the next study and so on. The idea that God has provided a solution to our problem, right? To the problem of the bad news. God provided a solution in his son, Jesus Christ. Well, he was telling me when we were talking on the phone, he was telling me they've, they've taken a new approach where they don't even go to the good news until somebody understands the bad news. Because, because if you can't help somebody understand the good news, I mean the bad news, excuse me, if you can't help somebody understand the bad news, the good news is not going to mean anything to them. Uh, you know, if, if you are talking to somebody about and trying to give them the gospel and they say, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. And you know, as long as I do good things, then God's going to let me into heaven. There's no reason to even talk to him about Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made on the cross and all of those things because they're not ready for that. They need to hear the bad news first. They need to understand that they're lost and that they need a Savior. In, in other words, the idea is if somebody is, not in, if somebody is not at the point where they understand they need a Savior, you're not going to do any good by telling them about the Savior. So the reality of it is... They're, they're taking the approach, they're, they're, these guys anyway, but Duluth are taking the approach, give them the, give them the bad news, and if you think they understand the bad news, then give them the good news. Uh, but a lot of people that you'll talk to won't even understand the bad news, and the problem is there's two, uh, there's two views. Both, all the problem is that they don't realize they need a Savior. One of them is that you know, this idea of their good works, that they're going to do some good things, and that's going to get them to, into heaven. And the other one is if somebody thinks they're saved... And they're actually not because they don't think they need a Savior, right? If somebody who thinks, oh, because I'm a member of such and such a church, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. Well, now how do you tell them about the Savior and the need for the Savior when they don't get it, right? They don't understand. They don't think they need a Savior. So there's no reason to move on to the good news. Now, I, I don't know if that's the right approach. It, it might be um, a, good, a good idea because the reality is if you, don't, if you can't make them understand the bad news, then they're not going to. They're not going to get the good news. They're not going to get the importance of the good news, I guess, would be one way to put it, right? They, if they don't know that they need a Savior, then the good news, I don't know. But see, to me, you can, almost, you can almost move on to the good news because you can explain, in giving the good news, you can explain God actually sent His Son to die for the human race. And if there were some other way, if your good works could somehow get you to heaven or if membership in a church could get you to heaven, or if any other thing could possibly get you to heaven, then God would have just said, well, okay, y'all just do that stuff and get to heaven. And he certainly wouldn't have sent his son. I mean, anybody who understands the idea of sacrificing a son, you know, the whole picture you had with Abraham and Isaac, anybody who has children has a vivid picture of what that must have been like. And so the you can go on and give the good news and say, well, look, let me just tell you this. You know, God actually sent his son to die for you. And if there were another way for you to get to heaven, he wouldn't have done that. So maybe you can emphasize the bad news even more clearly by explaining part of the good news. Anyway, I leave that before you in terms of your own giving of the gospel as to whether you should do that or not. Then we talked about this, the being presented in four ways. The idea of personal sin, the sin nature, imputed sin, and the estate of sin. Personal sin is that sin which we do day by day when we fail to conform to the holy character of God. The sin nature is the corruption of the flesh that occurred at the fall of Adam. It's a depraved character enslaved to sin. It's in an Adam and all of his posterity. This is very important to understand. This sin nature is transmitted through the human father. Why is that important? Because Jesus Christ didn't have a human father, did he? And so because he didn't have a human father, he was born into this world without a sin nature. He was born into this world without imputed sin. Imputed sin and the sin nature are two different things. The sin nature is the corruption of the very flesh we dwell in. Imputed sin is an accounting thing. We were all credited with our, to our account Adam's original sin. So when you were born into this world, you had a little account ledger and on the liability side, if you will, instead of an asset side, on the liability side, 
you had in your account Adam's original sin. That's the idea of imputed sin. We are condemned in Adam. And that puts us in the estate of sin, which is a positional reality of being under sin. So in other words, every one of us, and I talked about this last time, it's the great equalizer. Every one of us is condemned in Adam. And what that means is it's not a matter of comparing personal sins. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you sin one way and I sin another, if you, or if you've sinned half as much as I have. And that's liable to be true, by the way. Your pastor is a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. But maybe you've only sinned half as much as I have, and maybe we can get into a uh, discussion or an argument about personal sins. But it doesn't matter. None of that matters because we're all condemned in Adam. And that's actually an amazing blessing because... Having been all condemned in Adam, in exactly the same way we were all condemned, now in exactly in the same way we can all be saved, and that is in Christ. And so when you die, when you leave this, when you leave this world, you will either be in Adam or in Christ. If you're in Adam, then you're destined for the lake of fire. If you're in Christ, then you're destined for glory for all eternity. So that's the bottom line. So these are the four things. Now let me talk about some of these things a little bit more. First of all, we talked about personal sin. Relates to some particular command of God in Scripture. It's the idea of missing the mark. That's the hamartia in the Greek. Missing the mark of God's own character of holiness. Remember, it could be in, it could be in, in thought. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. It's an action, it's a thought, it's, it's any time we deviate from the holy character of God. It includes an aspect of rebellion or disobedience in it, and it can be an act of commission or omission. James 4.17 means if we know the, it says if we know the right thing to do and do not do it, to him it is sin, right? That is, that is a really convicting one. I told you about Romans 14, which says anything not done in faith is sin, right? If I, if I do something and I lack faith then that is a sin as well. All right, so we could go through this. It was suggested to me to go through and teach about all the different sins. And actually, I thought about it, and I I began to do the study of that. And believe it or not, it becomes quite involved. There's a lot of sins mentioned in Scripture. Paul actually said, though, that we're not supposed to dwell on that. We're supposed to dwell on what is pure, what is holy, what is good. That's what we're supposed to dwell on. And... I think that's a better approach, but what I do want to talk to you about is the different categories of sin, because I throw out terminology, and I think you understand it, but I shouldn't assume that. I mentioned mental attitude sins. Now, what did Christ teach? He said that if you, you've heard that you should not commit adultery... But if you lust after someone, you've committed adultery in your heart. So even though the overt act has not taken place, you've actually already committed a mental attitude sin. Bitterness is a mental attitude sin. Anger is a mental attitude sin. And let me give you an example. So all these are important. Bitterness and anger, those, those, are, those are two sins that go together. You may have bitterness and anger and unforgiveness in your heart, and you may never overtly act upon that. Nobody may ever see any thing that results from that but the bitterness and the anger and the unforgiveness those are mental attitude sins there's sins of the tongue studied that certainly in the book of james uh that's something we we talk about quite a bit the sins of the tongue that's an overt act but it's not as though i've committed murder or stolen stolen something see this is the thing when you're talking to someone and i know about this recently uh with some conversations that were had by by Jerry to her brother that, you know, and please lift up Jerry's brother in prayer. Uh, Jerry's been witnessing to him, but um, he's got this idea. And a lot of, a lot of unbelievers have this idea. Well, I've never, I've never killed anybody. I don't go steal things. I don't do blah, 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 blah. But when you understand the biblical doctrine of sin and you understand all the categories of sin, have you ever been mad at someone? You sinned. Have you ever been bitter about something? You sinned. Have you ever lied? Well, that's an overt act that almost everybody's done, right? I mean, who can you find that hasn't told at least one lie? Okay, you haven't murdered, you haven't stolen, but you know what? You have violated the holy character of God. And the beauty of it is in the book of James, it says if you transgress the law in one way, you have transgressed the entire law. Do you know what that means? It means that when you lie, 
you did the same thing as committing murder or adultery or stealing or coveting or anything else. When you transgress the law, you've transgressed the whole thing. So there's no minor sins. There's no, and the problem is what we have when people start ma- having conversations like that is that they're getting into that relative righteousness thing. Well, I've never done this, right? I've never done what Adolf Hitler did, or I've never done what Jeffrey Dahmer did, or I've never done, right? You've got all these people who, who bring up those kinds of things. But the fact of the matter is that when you really study sin, you'll find out there's all kinds of categories. And, there's the, and like I said, the sin of omission. Who hasn't known the right thing to do and then not done it? Everybody's done that. Everybody's failed in that way. Who's, who has not failed in terms of doing something and lacked faith in doing it? You know, I mean, good example of that. Here's what I'm talking about. And the, this can be good things. The Romans 14 thing can be good things. When Mike Blackwell took off and went to Thailand, if he did that and he lacked faith, if he doubted in any way that he was supposed to be doing that, then in going to Thailand to be a missionary, it sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? But if he goes over there and does that and he lacks faith, he's actually sinning. Anything done with a lack of faith is a sin. That's pretty pretty high standard, isn't it? That's a pretty high standard. So what that means is, what I'm trying to tell you is, no matter how righteous you may think you are in your walk, you sin. All of us do. All of us commit sins. It's almost impossible for us to avoid the mental attitude sins. And then even if we avoid the mental attitude sins, we're going to fall into this, the sin of omission or the sin of lack of faith. We all will fall short. We all fail. But thankfully, God provided a mechanism for getting past that. If we sin, we just confess it before God, a true confession, agreement with God, and we move on. But personal sins are pervasive. No one is without them. No one is without them. The only, the only one person we can think of who was without sin was our Savior Jesus Christ. He went his whole life without committing a personal sin. That's amazing because it's unlikely I'm going to go the rest of the day without committing a sin, right? I'm going to almost certainly commit some kind of sin between now and the end of the day. And he went his whole life without committing any sin. So all of us are sinners. Everybody in this room, we're all sinners saved by grace. All right? That's the fact of the matter. It's not an excuse for sin. That's just the reality that... Sin is is pervasive, but mental attitude sins are just as bad as any other sin. Now, the sin nature speaks to the entire nature being corrupted in the fall. It includes our will, our conscience, our intellect. The understanding has been darkened and our heart is hard. We looked at this last time. So our very nature is depraved in terms of the fallen body that we dwell in. It's depraved. Now, thankfully, when you're born again, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ and you're born again, guess what? You get a new nature, which you didn't have before. It's created in Christ, and it's something new, and it's something perfect. And it's something that if you're abiding in Christ and you're functioning in the new nature, you won't sin. And 1 John speaks to that. You will not sin if you're functioning in the new nature. The problem is when we take our eyes off of Christ and we start looking to things of the world or becoming selfish. And then we start to succumb to our old nature, the old sin nature. And in the process of doing that, we then commit sin. All right, so that's the corruption. Now, there's a lot of terms, by the way. I don't know if I have that document with me or not. Let me see real quick. I put together a document that had different terms For the sin nature, and I don't know if I brought it with me. I may not have. I don't think I did. So, but let me give you some of the ideas. The flesh. Many times the terminology in the scriptures that refers to the sin nature, it says the flesh, because that's where the sin nature dwells, is in the flesh. So the term flesh often speaks of the sin nature. You can have the old man or the old self. Depends on your translation. In the New American Standard, it's the old self. In the King James, it's the old man. That's a reference to the sin nature. Sometimes, not always, sin, when it's mentioned in the singular, is also a reference to the sin nature. Let me see if I can pull that up real quick. I know it's in Romans somewhere. I don't know if it's in chapter 5. Yeah, 
Here's a reference to the old self here in Romans 6, 6. It talks about the old self. That's a reference to the sin nature. Here in Romans 6, 12, here's sin singular. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. That's a reference to the sin nature. And actually, there's a lot of references in this, in this chapter. But I'm trying to find the... Here we go. The conflict of two natures. This is Paul, you know, this is the Apostle Paul writing about the conflict of the two natures. And he goes on in here and says, uh, he says, I know that nothing good dwells in me. And some would say that right there, by the way, as a reference to the sin nature. Nothing good, the no good thing. If you, were, if you translate that literally uh, from the Greek, you end up, I know that no good thing dwells in me. So that phrase, no good thing, is also a reference to the sin nature. And here he identifies it, that is in my flesh, right? And he says here in verse 20, but if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. That's the sin nature. Now recognize he's not making an excuse here. He's not saying, oh, look, I'm not doing that. It's the sin that's doing it. What he's, what he's saying is, look, it's not, he, he knows that in, in his innermost being, he wants to do what's right for God, but he succumbed to the sin nature which dwells in him. And then here he calls it evil. I find then the principle that evil is present in me. And so here evil is used as a reference to the sin nature. And he says, I am the one, as he is the one who wants to do good. And then there's a reference in here, the law of sin. That's another reference to the sin nature itself. The body of this death, that's a reference to the sin nature, the flesh which has the sin nature in it. So in that particular section, there's a bunch of terms that are used to refer to the sin nature. So recognize that you won't have this phrase like this, sin nature, in your scriptures. There's a lot of different terms, though, that are used to describe the sin nature, our old nature. Ephesians chapter 2 is another one. I can remember that from when I was looking at this. Ephesians chapter 2, lusts of the flesh, reference to the sin nature, desires of the flesh, Sin nature, Ephesians two three. Among them too, we all for, uh, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh, and were by nature. And there's the idea of the nature by nature, children of wrath. And then you have the beautiful thing. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. So the idea that even though we were sinners and had a sin nature, He rescued us he loved us and rescued us from that through faith in christ but here's my point is the sin nature don't don't expect that you're going to see this phrase in your scriptures there's a lot of different terms that refer to the sin nature in terms of personal sin there's all kinds of lists out there i'll tell you this if you're interested in pursuing personal sins and trying to understand all the different sins that are mentioned in the scripture be careful on that a number of them that i looked at mentioned some things that are actually not uh, currently commandments for us to break. They were commandments given to the Israelites and they don't pertain directly to us anymore. But trust me when I tell you, you're going you're gonna to be looking at hundreds of them. Hundreds of different things that are defined as sin. By the way, anytime you violate a command of God, you're transgressing, right? You're transgressing a command of God. There's actually a, you know, a command that says avoid, avoid all types of evil. So if you fail to avoid some type of evil, just by failing to avoid that type of evil, you've sinned because you've transgressed that commandment of God. If you start looking at all the different commandments that are in the Scripture, you're going to see there's a lot of them. And so, but uh, you've got to be careful about it. Make sure you're, you're clear on what it is that pertains to us here in the, in the dispensation of the church. But it's, it's uh, very, very extensive. But I encourage you, instead of focusing on that, I encourage you to focus on the holy things. And if you focus on the holy things and you try to abide in Christ and dwell in Him, then, um, then by doing that, by dwelling and abiding in Christ, then you're going to avoid the sin in the first place. It, it is important, I guess, to know something about sin so you can know what you need to confess. But uh, maybe at some point I'll do that, but I think that's a, that can be overwhelming. I think if I, if I really sat down and taught you all the different sins, you'd walk out of here just trembling because you'd think, man, I, I'm going to sin every time I breathe. I mean, that's how you'd feel, honestly. It would almost be overwhelming. Imputed sin now is a different, different story. When Adam sinned, we all sinned with him. 
Romans 5.12 speaks to that. It says, there, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin. So we all participate in Adam's sin, Adam's original sin. We sinned with him. Adam's original sin has been imputed to the entire human race. Verses 13 and 14 go on to talk about that, sin being imputed. And it talks about how death reigned from Adam until Moses. Now, what verse 13 is talking about, by the way, is the idea that really the law was handed down in order to make it very, very clear about sin, right? It basically describes sin in detail. And nonetheless, what he says in verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. In other words, until Moses wrote down the Pentateuch, death was still reigning because all men were under the condemnation of Adam's original sin. We may not have sinned in that likeness, but we were all under that sin. This is important. Uh, there's two things that we need to understand. I want to make perfectly clear. Well, number one, we're all condemned under this. The promised consequence of death has been applied to every member of the human race. We looked at, that, we looked at this last time. All of us have been given that. And, and it, says, it says, whosoever believes in Jesus Christ shall have eternal life, but whoever does not, whoever disobeys and rejects, is already condemned. And what that's talking about is that we're all, the whole race as a corporate body was condemned in Adam. So what that means is everybody's condemned and then through faith in Jesus Christ we're rescued from that condemnation. This is actually a very positive thing. What it means is that your condemnation is based upon that, not personal sins. And your personal sins are still offensive to God, don't get me wrong. But your condemnation is based upon Adam's original sin. And what it means is that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ unto salvation, when you trust in him for your eternal salvation, you're now rescued from that condemnation and it is now perfectly assigned to you that you have eternal life. All the things, and we're going to have, a, we're going to have classes on this, all the things that happen at the moment of faith in Christ. You are now part of the body of Christ. You are now one of God's children and nothing that you can do can change that. That's Romans chapter 8. Let me turn there. Romans chapter 8. It starts out in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a very important term. Paul uses that term in a very specific way, in Christo. What it means is that the moment when you, when you came into this world, you were in Adam. The moment you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you were taken from that estate of being in Adam and you were placed in the estate of being in Christ. And that's positional, and that's forever, all right? No condemnation. Go to the last verse, or verses. And Paul concludes this chapter with, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No condemnation, no separation. If you want to have anything to help you remember Romans chapter 8, it's no condemnation, no separation. You are no longer condemned in Christ Jesus. You cannot be separated from him. Hang on just one second. As a result, there's no sin you can commit that will cause you to lose your salvation. It's not possible. And I'll talk about in a minute something known as the unpardonable sin, which is misunderstood greatly. Yes, ma'am. That's what he's saying. Yeah, when he says, I am convinced, he means the same thing. In other words, beyond a shadow of a doubt. You, you, could, you could insert that in there in, in, a, in a italics. I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that neither death. I think convinced is a stronger, a stronger language, actually. I'm convinced. Nobody could, nobody could try, to, try to pry him away from that conviction that he has. He's absolutely convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities and so on. 
It's even stronger language. Now, there's something that's mentioned in the Bible known as the unpardonable sin, that is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Well, first of all, the only equivalent that we have of that today, of that unpardonable sin, is if somebody rejects Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the only thing we have today. That sin is something you can't actually commit today in terms of what was described, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Let me explain why. What was happening in that is that there were those during the time of Christ while he was walking on this earth, there were those who were ascribing the miracles that he was performing to be deeds of Satan that he was performing under the power, the same power as the demons were, and that what he was doing was satanic. And instead, if you understand, this is going to go pretty deep, but if you understand the kenosis, that when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to the earth in the flesh, he set aside all of his privileges. He did not function as deity on this earth. Instead, he functioned as humanity, under the empowerment of God the Holy Spirit. So the miracles, the prophecy, everything that he accomplished in his life was done in the power of the Holy Spirit. So when somebody ascribed those miracles and all that he did to Satan, they were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now that's not something that you and I can do today because Jesus Christ is no longer walking on this earth. But somebody who rejects him is in effect blaspheming the Holy Spirit in the sense that they're saying, you're telling them about Christ and who He is, and they reject all that. So that's the only equivalent that we have today of committing the unpardonable sin, and the only sin that cannot be forgiven is rejecting Christ. Because all sins, this is very important for you to understand, all sins, including Adam's original sin, and every other sin, All sins were placed upon Jesus Christ on the cross. And he paid the penalty for them. The only reason that rejection of Christ is a quote-unquote unpardonable sin is because you will not receive the blessing. The blood of Christ will not be applied to your life because you rejected Christ and you remain in Adam. That's the only reason it's an unpardonable sin. So two things I want to make sure we're clear on. We're all condemned in Adam and thereby saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Eternal security. We cannot lose our salvation. That's, that's very important for you to understand. You cannot lose your salvation. And there is no such thing as an unpardonable sin today except for the rejection of Christ. Now the estate of sin. Whoops, I'm sorry. The estate of sin. Whether Jew or Gentile. doesn't matter, doesn't matter if you're of the, the chosen people the Jews, or if you're a Gentile, you're under sin. Romans 3, nine. Romans 3, nine. I've been failing in terms of not turning in my Bible again, haven't I? I'm so bad about that. The context here is... Uh, Verse 5 here, Romans 3, 5, he says, But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be, for otherwise how will God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we are slanderously reported and as some claim that we say, Let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Now, it's important to remember this. This is a very important phrase right here. And there's there's a context for this in what Paul was saying. Many of the Jews, by the way, thought that they were better than the Gentiles. They did. They thought they were superior because they had been chosen by God, an earthly people chosen out by God, and they thought they were superior. And so Paul is saying, are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Now, this is something to be 
very aware of that you don't ever want to become self-righteous in your walk. Don't think for a minute that because you have been saved from condemnation, because you know that you're going to be in heaven for all eternity and in glory with God for all eternity, don't for a second assume that you're better than someone else. You're not. We're all under sin. We've been saved out of the murky mire, out of the darkness and into the light. But is it because I'm so awesome? No. In fact, I'll point out something to you. There was a great thing that uh, Pastor Scott Johnson pointed out to me that's in a, a verse that's in the Magnificat or however that's supposed to be pronounced. This is Mary talking, the earthly mother of our Savior. And she says here in verse 46 of Luke chapter 1, My soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. She needed a Savior too, right? She's a sinner saved by grace. Verse 48, For he has had regard for the humble state, humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. The mighty one has done great things for me. Don't ever start to get prideful when you start to think about all the things that you're doing for God. Always remember that this is the right perspective. The mighty one has done great things for me. If a ministry opportunity, if a door for ministry opens, recognize what God did for you. If you have the strength... If you have the spiritual maturity to participate in a ministry, recognize what God has done for you. We need to get away from the idea of what we're doing for God and instead understand it's what He's doing for us. Now, I'm not saying don't be involved in ministries. I encourage that. We're going to talk about that a little bit here in a moment. I encourage that. But always keep the right perspective. It's what God is doing for you. And you don't deserve any of it. I don't deserve any of it. Whatever he's doing for me, I don't deserve it at all. So we're all shut up under sin and we're not better than anyone else. We're all shut up in the estate of sin so that God can show his mercy in the promise of salvation by faith. Romans 11.32 It says, for God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Again, I don't know how to explain this where it can be uh, as clear as I want it to be. But the fact that we were all shut up under sin, that we were all held under sin in the estate of sin because of Adam's original sin, that the whole human race was found guilty because of Adam's original sin... That's actually an amazing blessing because he shut us up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Because we are all condemned in the same way, we can all be saved in the same way through faith in Jesus Christ. And then Galatians 3.22. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. says, but the scripture, now we have the scripture itself. The scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that, purpose clause, the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Now, all of us, all of us were held under the law, all of us. But the point of the matter is, The scripture itself, God, through his word, has shut us all up under sin. We're all held under sin. Again, that was the purpose of the law, wasn't it? The purpose of the law was to show us that we can't measure up to God's standards. Nobody could keep the law except for Jesus Christ. He's the only one. No one else could keep the law. Everybody fell short. By all being shut up, though, in the estate of sin, in Adam, he's able to then show us mercy 
in the promise of salvation by faith. The Bible clearly indicates the devastating effects of sin upon man and the hopelessness of man's attempts to solve his own sin problem. Sin is devastating. By the way, one thing I'll tell you is this. Mental attitude sins. If they're allowed to fester, if you allow mental attitude sins to fester in your soul, it is inevitable that eventually it will have an impact on how you act and speak and everything else toward other people. It's just inevitable. Because if bitterness continues to fester in your soul, for example, then eventually you're going to start to act out on that bitterness. Now, the moment that you become angry about something, you may not do anything overt. You may commit a mental attitude sin at that time, and you may not do anything overt, but if that anger festers, then eventually you will do something overt. You'll say something. You'll do something. Sin is devastating upon our souls. You, 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 pe- pe- people today, they, they, it's amazing. It, it just shocks me every time when people are out there and they're so concerned about what they can do about the promiscuity that's going on in the world today. And their answer is, hand out condoms. Why don't we consider what it's doing to people's souls? Has anybody ever thought about that? What is happening to people's souls when this stuff is going on? You're not going to fix that with some latex rubber. It's not going to solve a problem. There's more going on there than just physical stuff. I mean, I know the whole revolution that took place in the 60s the whole idea was to try to convince us that it's you know about the free love and it's just it's just it's just a physical thing it's not it's more than that sin is devastating and it's hopeless by the way it's devastating in terms of also being held under sin and it's hopeless for us to try to solve our sin problem on our own we can't do it the proper understanding of the doctrine of sin is essential to understanding god's remedy for our sin problem in other words if you don't understand the effect that sin had upon the entire human race, the effect that sin has upon you personally day by day, then you can't understand the solution. Now, God's solution, God's remedy, was to send His Son. And that has an impact on your life in terms of salvation, but that also has an impact upon your life in terms of day by day, your day by day rescue from sin. And we'll talk about that in just a minute uh, as well. Well, that's the end of our study of sin. Next time we're going to study on... uh, salvation from the penalty of sin but let's take a look at our scripture of the day it's james 1 19 and just start right here at the at the middle of the verse because the uh the first part of verse 19 is actually a reference to what came before this you know my beloved brethren and he goes on in the second half of verse 9 he says but everyone must be quick to hear slow to speak and slow to anger For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, this is important. When I taught through the book of James, which I did multiple times, it's important to understand that there is such a thing as righteous anger. But I put forth to you today that most of the time, when you become angry, it is not righteous anger. It is prideful anger. It's selfish anger. It's anger from the standpoint of of pride for lack of a better way to say it. But there is such a thing as righteous anger. If there are things that God is angry with, don't you think we should be angry at those those same things? That's why it says in verse 19, it doesn't say slow to speak and never anger. What it says is slow to anger. Slow to anger. And the reason why we need to be slow to anger is because we need to make sure that our anger is truly righteous and not based in some pride. I mean, most of the time when we get anger, uh, angry, it's, it's based in something like somebody does something And we think, well, who are they to do something like that to me, right? You have this sort of a, and that's pride. That's all that kind of thing is. But anger that's based in understanding that if God is angry at something, then we also should be angry at it. That's different. But our anger, that's why it says the anger of man. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Our own selfish, prideful anger, it falls short of the righteousness of God. But quick to hear and slow to speak. We all can learn from that. I still am trying to learn that. I often speak too quickly. And I, whenever, whenever I read this verse, I think of my brother in Christ from Austin Bible Church, Lee Smith. If you have a conversation with Lee Smith and you say something to Lee, he'll sit there and he'll... 
and then he'll respond. He always takes a moment to think about what he's getting ready to say. I can learn from that. And it's not that he's slow. He's a rice grad. He's a smart guy. I mean, he's a very smart guy. It's not that he's slow. It's that he's thinking about what he's going to say. He's mulling it over and thinking about what he's going to say. We can learn from that. Quick to hear is important too, though, because we need to be ready to hear and listen to what people are saying. Verse 21, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Now, what is that? That's, that's all that stuff that we did when we were unbelievers. And yet we still do it, right? I mean, that's first... First Peter, we've been learning about that in First Peter in our study there. And in First Peter, it says you've had plenty of time to indulge yourself in all that stuff. I don't care when you were saved. You had plenty of time to indulge yourself in the things of the world, the lusts of the flesh, the things of, of sin. You had plenty of time. So put aside all that filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. And you don't get saved by doing that. Some people preach that. You get saved through faith in Jesus Christ. But as a born-again believer... Put aside that stuff. That's what you did when you were an unbeliever. Put it aside. Stop living like that. I hear people, I hear people say from time to time, it's just who I am. <laughs> no, it's who you were, right? It's who you were. But you're a new creation in Christ. That was the whole lesson, uh, I think. Help me out. That was one of the primary lessons of uh, me, myself, and lies is that you need to start thinking about yourself as this new creation in Christ. You're something different. All those things that you think about yourself in terms of who you are and all, all those things that you inundate your thinking with in terms of who you are, all of that stuff is who you used to be. So put all that stuff aside. Start living in the, in the new creation. And then it goes on. It says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. And this is talking to believers. So we're not talking about regenerative salvation here we're not talking about the moment of faith in christ what we're talking about here is the word of god itself implanted in our souls saves us day by day it's what was talked about in first john 1 7 how the blood of christ cleanses us on a continual basis the word of god can save our souls on a day-by-day -day basis this is not a a salvation as in faith in christ passage this is a Saving our souls on a day-by-day -day basis. And then verse 22. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. In other words, right now you're sitting in a Bible class, you're hearing the word of God being taught. You read through the scriptures, you're taking in the word of God. Okay? When you hear the word of God, it's then upon you to be a doer of it. In other words, to live it out in your life. It's upon you to live it out. Now, what does that mean? It means in terms of the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act. Prove yourselves doers of the words. If you only hear the word and you never, you never live according to it, then you're deluding yourself. In other words, the delusion is you think, man, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do for God. But you're not. What are we doing right here? We're preparing ourselves. We're being built up in preparation for what it is that we're going to do day by day. Doers of the words. Now, this brings me to something I want to talk about real briefly before we close, because this is Communion Sunday. I had one of the, one of the members of the flock came forward and talked with me and Terry about ministry opportunity. And it has to do with trying to reach out to individuals in the community. I'm praying about it. I'm going to probably talk to the deacons about it. Reach out to the members of the community and give the gospel and uh, help them in other ways. And I'm thankful that that was done, that I had an opportunity to discuss that. Um, I want to encourage you, as you hear about or learn about opportunities for ministry, that you would bring that to me. We are supposed to be doers of the word, and that includes inside this building and outside this building. What I don't want you to do, and this is so prevalent in the world today, is to show up on a Sunday morning, and now you have, you have an hour or two on Sunday morning, depending on if you come to both, excuse me, both classes or not, an hour or two on Sunday morning where you're following God, and then you walk out that door, and then you go back to doing what you've always done, and you're just living like anybody else out there in this lost and dying world. 
We're supposed to be doers of the word. So when we get out into that world, when we go out that door, we're supposed to be doers of the word in every aspect of our lives. And that includes ministry opportunities. I really, one of my huge burdens, I got two huge burdens for this local church. One of them is that we would find ministry opportunities out there in this community, in Bastrop, Smithville area, where we can, we can have an impact on people's lives and, and not just from the standpoint of, of the earthly comforts that they might need, but also in terms of giving them the gospel and spiritual comfort and things that can come through that. I really have a burden for that. My second burden is totally different. It has to do with I really, I love to sing, and I hope someday we have a, a small group that comes up and, and sings together. But the, the, the first burden is the idea of I believe that as a local church, we're supposed to have an impact upon this community in the Bastrop Smithville area. Uh, and so I, I really encourage you, if you hear about ministry opportunities, if you hear about things that we might be able to do and be doers of the word, please come to me and talk to me about that or come to Terry and talk to her about that because we need to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So try to learn this passage again. If you, if you only remember, this is, this is loaded with stuff. If you only remember quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, be a doer, not just a hearer, receive the word implanted, and you remember it, it's in James chapter 1, then that's success. That's success. But that's our scripture of the week. I encourage you to try to memorize that. Well, next time we will come back, Lord willing, rapture pending, we will come back and look at salvation from the penalty of sin. And what we're going to look at is uh, in that topic, we're going to talk about the rescue we get from the penalty of sin. We're going to also have a little bit in there about being rescued from the power of sin. There's the three the three phases they talk about it. There's salvation from the penalty of sin. That's through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation from the power of sin. That's day by day by day through confession of sin and abiding in Christ and in his love. And then thirdly, there is salvation from the very presence of sin. And that comes when we're removed from this earth, from this earthly body. We're removed from the very presence of sin. And so we'll talk about those things, Lord willing. And rapture pending. But let's go ahead and close in prayer so we can sing our final hymn and have communion. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth of your word and how it instructs us in the understanding of sin, the devastating effects of sin, the condemnation that we were slated to face. For sin, had it not been for your perfect plan to save us from that condemnation. And I'm so thankful that you pierced the veil and opened my eyes that I might understand the truth of the gospel and believe in your son Jesus Christ and through that be saved forever, have eternal life. But I don't deserve that, Father, and I don't deserve day by day what you bless me with. And I pray that I never think that somehow I deserved it or am better than anyone else. And I pray that as we come to understand sin and its devastating effects, that we do turn our eyes toward our Savior Jesus Christ and we focus upon the things that are pure and good and holy and start to take our eyes off of sin, that we might not continue to live as we have in the past, that we would put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. Father, every one of us continues to participate in things that we did as an unbeliever. We continue to show filthiness and wickedness in our lives. It's an aspect of every believer, but we ask that you would continue to convict us on that, that we would put those things aside and start walking in the light, abiding in Christ and glorifying Jesus Christ with everything that we do. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen.